More than 80 years ago, on May 1st, 1933, at a communist rally in Union Square in New York City, Dorothy Day and a small troop of followers distributed the first issue of the Catholic Worker newspaper. She described his purpose in her first editorial, which was written, along with the rest of the paper, on her kitchen table. For those who are sitting on park benches in the warm spring sunlight, for those who are huddling in shelters trying to escape the rain, for those who are walking the streets in the all but futile search for work, for those who think that there is no hope for the future, no recognition for their plight, this little paper is addressed. It is printed to call their attention to the fact that the Catholic Church has a social program, to let them know that there are men of God who are working not only for their spiritual, but for their material welfare. She'd sought no permission or authorization from the hierarchy before launching this paper. She had no clerical advisor or board of directors. She herself was a convert of only six years, an unwed single mother with fairly limited Catholic contacts and little theological formation beyond her reading of scripture, the Baltimore Catechism, and the lives of the saints. And yet in the midst of the Great Depression, she perceived the need for a new Catholic voice, one that would relate the gospel to the plight of the poor and the struggle for social justice. And she undertook on her own initiative to provide that voice. By the time of her death, nearly 50 years later, Dorothy Day was widely regarded as the radical conscience of the American Catholic Church. The historian David O'Brien, in an obituary for Commonwealth, described her as, quote, the most important, interesting, and influential figure in the history of American Catholicism, a statement that's suddenly become uh, even more plausible in light of Pope Francis's surprising decision to cite her among the four great Americans he held up as moral beacons. As I said earlier today, it was not always so. For most of Dorothy's life, she was a fairly marginal figure, far outside the mainstream, operating without any official support or recognition from the church hierarchy, unfamiliar to most readers of the Catholic press. No Catholic bishop attended her funeral. As a convert to Catholicism, she remained quite traditional in her religious practice. She attended Mass each day. As a Benedictine oblate, she prayed from a breviary. She was never without her rosary. Steeped in the lives of the saints, her everyday speech and writing were filled with references to figures like St. Augustine, Teresa of Avila, Francis of Assisi. And yet there was something different about her. Different from almost anyone who came before because she consciously combined her traditional faith with a radical approach to social and political issues. It was a conjunction of attitudes that didn't really exist before Dorothy Day came along. Together with other radicals, she marched in demonstrations, walked on picket lines, and was regularly arrested for acts of civil disobedience, the last time depicted here when she was 75. Like many of the saints she revered, she spent her life in active service to the poor. But she didn't stop with charity and the works of mercy. She joined the practice of charity with a passion for social justice. She believed it was not enough to feed the poor, but we must ask why they are poor. We must analyze and expose and resist those structures and institutional forces that give rise to poverty and the need for so much charity. The Catholic Worker was the name of her newspaper, which sells today as it did 82 years ago for a penny a copy. The Catholic Worker is also the name of a lay Catholic movement that has attempted to show how the radical gospel commandment of love can be lived. G.K. Chesterton once said that Christianity has not been tried and failed, it has been found difficult and not tried. Dorothy Day was someone who set out to disprove that statement. No one having met her could claim that Christianity has not been tried. As a result, some people called her a communist. Such criticism didn't really bother her very much. She liked to say that it was the complacency of Christians in her youth that had made her love the communists. And it was the communists in turn with their love of the poor who had led her to Christ. For his part, J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, said of her, for you young people here, this is, this is what he actually sounded like. 
Dorothy Day is a very erratic and irresponsible person. She has engaged in activities which, which strongly suggest that she is consciously or unconsciously being used by communist groups. From past experience with her, it is obvious she maintains a very hostile and belligerent attitude toward the Bureau and makes every effort to castigate the FBI whenever she feels so inclined. When I read this to her, she was delighted. <laughs> he makes me sound like a mean old woman, she said. Read it again. <laughs> this is in her FBI file, which I obtained with her grudging support under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, about 600 fascinating pages. <laughs> When Dorothy's cause for canonization was endorsed by the U.S. bishops a few years ago, a senator from Virginia, a state senator, wrote Pope Benedict to say he was revolted by the thought that a person of such loathsome character might be considered a saint. She took such criticism in stride. I would recall the time when she was uh, speaking at a Catholic college and a young man got up to denounce her as a communist, a heretic, a traitor, and a long list of other offenses. She listened patiently and then said, you neglected to mention that I was once arrested on a morals charge in Chicago. <laughs> on the other hand, many people also called her a saint, which was another matter. Don't call me a saint, she was quoted as saying, I don't want to be dismissed so easily. When I say she was quoted, I may well mean quoted by me. I used this line in 1984 in the introduction to uh, my edition of her selected writings though I actually have no recollection of the original source. And yet I'm constantly surprised to discover this, the one line of Dorothy Day's that everyone seems to know. Uh, it's even the title of a documentary about her. And I have some regrets about this, uh, in, so far as it gives the impression that Dorothy was cynical about the naming and veneration of saints, which couldn't be farther from the truth. What Dorothy opposed, and I can't imagine that any saint would not, was being put on a pedestal, fitted to some preconceived model of holiness that would strip her of her humanity and at the same time blunt the radical challenge of the gospel. After all, people might say, well, you know, Dorothy could do such things, whether live in poverty or feed the hungry or go to, the go to jail for the cause of peace, because after all, she's a saint. The implication was that such actions, which would be unthinkable for a normal person, uh, must have come easily for her. But nothing came easily for Dorothy. As she said of her vocation, neither revolutions nor faith is one without keen suffering. For me, Christ was not to be bought for 30 pieces of silver, but with my heart's blood. And yet today, the church has initiated the cause for her canonization, a cause which I have supported. Above all, because I believe she embodies the type of holiness most necessary for our time. A holiness that is not concerned with its own purity, but empties itself to confront the burning issues of our time, poverty, violence, the desecration of nature, the meaning of work, the yearning for community, freedom, and peace. Of course, if, if she's eventually named St. Dorothy, she will be a saint with an unusual backstory. Having renounced Christianity in her youth, and spent her early years as a journalist and activist for radical causes. Among canonized saints, she would probably be unique for having been arrested the first time a 30-day stretch in Washington, D.C. for picketing in front of the White House on behalf of women's suffrage. Her friends were anarchists, communists, and assorted literary bohemians, including Mike Gold, who was later the editor of the Communist Daily Worker, and the playwright Eugene O'Neill, in the aftermath of an unhappy love affair, she had an abortion. This is, believe me, hardly the standard affair for Butler's lives with the saints. And yet there was always something in Dorothy, uh, a yearning for the transcendent. Like a character in Dostoevsky, she observed, all my life I've been haunted by God. Yet even the circumstances of her conversion were unusual. In fact, for likely unique in the annals of the saints, prompted by the experience of pregnancy and the birth of her daughter. This occurred while she was living on Staten Island with a man she deeply loved, Forster Batterham. After years of strife 
and on happiness, this experience of love and what she called natural happiness, turned her heart to the possibility of a greater happiness to be obtained from life. When she became pregnant, she found herself wishing to have her child baptized in the Catholic Church, a step that she would follow, though it meant a wrenching separation from Forster, who would have nothing to do with marriage. It also seemed, initially, to involve a painful betrayal of the working class. She believed the Catholic Church was the church of the poor, but to her radical friends, and sadly to her as well, it seemed more like a friend of the rich, the ultimate defender of the status quo. She knew nothing of Catholic social teaching, a term she was unlikely to hear in any typical Sunday sermon. She was literally at a loss as to how she might reconcile her faith and her loyalty to the cause of the oppressed. After her baptism in 1927, she spent the next five years in a kind of wilderness, praying to find some way of reconciling these two halves of her soul. The seeds of this dilemma went much further back in her life. Even as a young person, Dorothy recognized the need for a new type of saint. In her autobiography, The Long Loneliness, she describes her first childhood encounters with the lives of the saints, recalling how her heart was stirred by stories of their charity toward the sick, the maimed, the leper. But there was another question in my mind, she said. Why was so much done in remedying the evil instead of avoiding it in the first place? Where were the saints to try to change the social order not just to minister to the slaves, but to do away with slavery. In effect, Dorothy's vocation took form around this challenge. Her conversion to Catholicism and her work in founding the Catholic movement would come many years later, but the great underlying mission of her life was to join the practice of charity with the struggle for justice, thereby inventing a model of holiness that didn't really exist before. Because of Dorothy, Future generations of Christians would not have to ask her question, where are the saints to try to change the social order? It was a question she answered with her own life. Meanwhile, the search for this path took her in December 1932 to Washington to cover a thunder march of the unemployed. As she watched the ragged parade of men, led by many of her old communist comrades, she asked herself, why Catholics weren't leading such a march. This question led her to the shrine of the Immaculate Conception, where Pope Francis just recently said Mass. As this was actually on December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, there could have been a more auspicious setting. There she offered up a prayer, she said, with tears and anguish, that some way would open up for me to use what talents I possessed for my fellow workers, for the poor. She longed, as she put it, to make a synthesis, reconciling body and soul, this world and the next. When she returned to New York, she found Peter Morin waiting for her in her apartment. In that encounter, though, it took a while for her to realize that her prayer was answered. And in the Catholic work or movement that ensued, she found the synthesis she'd been seeking. Peter Morin was a French immigrant of peasant origins, 20 years her senior. He had spent many years tramping around the country, devising a philosophy aimed at unleashing the radical social implications of the gospel and looking for someone to help him set his ideas into motion. His philosophy was expressed in his easy essays, short phrased essays ideal for street corner de declamation. For example, the world would become better off if people tried to become better and people would become better if they stopped trying to become better off. <laughs> Peter Martin's first gift to Dorothy was a Catholic view of history and a personalist philosophy to replace the class struggle approach of her radical past. The future will be different, he proclaimed, if we make the present different. But before meeting Dorothy, he seems to have been singularly incapable of translating his abstract ideas into action on a scale larger than himself. One of the problems was his thick French accent. He compensated by discovering a way of non-stop talking, seemingly without the necessity of taking a breath. <laughs> his suit looked as if he had slept in it, 
that indeed he had. And he never bathed. Oh. <laughs> Asked why he didn't take more care for his appearance, he answered, so as not to arouse envy. <laughs> Even Dorothy acknowledged that for a long time she was not sure whether she really liked Peter. Nevertheless, she revered him as a saint and always credited him as the true founder of the Catholic worker. I think one of his major contributions was simply to give Dorothy a kind of permission to launch her own movement. Drawing on the lives of the saints, he showed that it wasn't necessary to wait for anyone to authorize or sponsor the way of discipleship. The saints began immediately with whatever means were at hand. If God blessed their venture, the means would arrive. For Dorothy, this meant launching the newspaper with no money, calling it the Catholic worker without seeking prior permission from the bishop or any other authority, daring to offer a Catholic perspective on social issues of the day that was far in advance of contemporary social teaching. Rather than just agitate about social injustice, articles in the Catholic Worker described what society would look like if it were organized around values of solidarity, community, and human dignity instead of selfishness and greed. Dorothy and Peter believed it was not enough to write about these ideas, we must live them out. So this led directly to houses of hospitality for the practice of the works of mercy, soup kitchens where the hungry could be fed. Those who joined the work lived in community, in voluntary poverty, among the poor they served. At the same time, as I've noted, Dorothy believed it was not enough just to care for the poor. It was also necessary to challenge, to protest, to resist the structures that cause such poverty, particularly the spirit of financial speculation, the valuation of capital and property over labor, and the diversion of resources to militarism. Many people, conservatives and liberals alike, were confounded by Dorothy's ability to integrate a traditional style of Catholic piety with a radical style of social engagement. But there was no paradox in her eyes. The basis of the synthesis she had been seeking was found in the central doctrine of her faith, the Incarnation. Her subsequent mission was rooted in the radical social implications of this doctrine, the fact that God had entered our humanity and our history so that all creation was hallowed and whatever we did for our neighbors, we did directly for him. This was the bedrock teaching of Jesus. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me a drink. And so far as you did these things, to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did them to me. In the very doctrine of the incarnation, Dorothy found the synthesis she had been seeking, the way to reconcile the body and soul, the spiritual and the material, the historical and the transcendent, the love of God and the love of neighbor, this world and the next. When Dorothy spoke of the real presence of Christ in the poor, many people accepted this and even applauded her wonderful work for the poor. It became more controversial when she extended this principle to solidarity with the labor movement and a general critique of the capitalist system. But when she applied this logic to the problem of war and violence, that was another matter. Yet she followed that logic all the way. Christ was present in the disguise of our neighbor, even in his most terrible disguise, in the face of the one we call our enemy. Her pacifism, expressed first during the Spanish Civil War, maintained throughout World War II and continued in the era of the war, a Cold War in Vietnam, caused outrage and scandal, even among many who admired her work. In the January 1942 issue of the uh, Catholic Worker, following the attack on Pearl Harbor, she shared her anguished prayer. Lord God, merciful God, our Father, shall we keep silent or shall we speak? And if we speak, what shall we say? Answering her own question, she wrote, we will print the words of Christ who is with us always, even to the end of the world. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Her manifesto, she declared, was the Sermon on the Mount. Nevertheless, the movement was bitterly divided. Many of her closest supporters parted ways. Subscriptions to the paper plummeted. Yet she believed that even in the case of an apparently just cause, a remnant must cling to the possibility of a different way. <laughs> 
The alternative, the logic of violence, she believed, led inevitably to the firebombing of Tokyo, the atomic bombs, and the possibility of humanity's final annihilation. No doubt her position was true folly in the eyes of the world, but we were not told to love up to the point of reason, prudence, or personal safety, but to love unreasonably, foolishly, profligately, unto the cross. In the era of nuclear weapons, she believed the teaching of indiscriminate love had become a practical necessity and imperative. To live under the canopy of such weapons without resisting, without raising an outcry, was in her view to participate in the ultimate blasphemy. During the beginning of the 1950s, the Catholic workers sponsored numerous protests against the dangers of nuclear war. For her own refusal to cooperate with New York City's compulsory civil defense drills, Dorothy served several jail terms. Most Catholic leaders at the time probably thought this was a foolish gesture. This was at a time when supposedly sane members of the political and military establishment saw a victory in a hypothetical war that might claim 100 million Russian lives at the expense of only 50 million of our own. In relation to such thinking, Dorothy did not mind being considered foolish, impractical, or even crazy. From her point of view, policies that were considered prudent, practical, and sane were in fact murderous, suicidal, and blasphemous. In a, yet I'm not aware that uh, any American bishop of that time spoke up in her defense, and certainly none joined her in jail. She did not expect great things to happen overnight. She knew the slow pace by which change and new life comes. It was, in a phrase she often repeated, by little and by little that we are saved. And yet she acted out of deep faith in the mystical bonds of cause and effect in which we are all connected. Any act of love might contribute to the balance of love in the world. Any suffering endured in love might ease the burden of others. We could only make use of the little things we possessed. The little faith, the little strength, the little courage. These were the loaves and fishes. We could only offer what we had and pray that God would make the increase. I first met Dorothy in 1975 when I was 19. I'd taken a leave from college after my sophomore year and made my way down to the Catholic work and hoping to learn something directly about life apart from books. I planned to stay a few months, but you know how things are. Somehow that stretched into five years, which as it turned out were the last five years of Dorothy's life. What was she like? She liked to tell the story about the time she visited a family in Rochester whose young child, upon being introduced, burst into tears. All day long he said, I've been hearing Dorothy Day is coming, Dorothy Day is coming. Now she's here and she's just an old woman. Certainly when I met her, she qualified as an old woman, tall and gaunt, leaning on a cane, wearing sensible shoes and donated clothes. Her long white hair was braided in a crown that she wore under a blue kerchief, her glasses hanging from a string around her neck. Dwight McDonald, a famous New Yorker profile, compared her to an elderly school teacher or a librarian. She has the typical air of mild authority, of being no longer surprised at anything children or book borrowers may do. <laughs> Naturally, I was quite intimidated. <laughs> Knowing the importance of first impressions, however, I, I spent a fair amount of time preparing to ask just the right question. When the time came, all I could do was blurt out, how do you reconcile Catholicism and anarchism? She looked at me with a bemused expression I would come to know well and said, it's never been a problem for me. <laughs> Lacking a follow-up question, I had no choice but to withdraw and ponder her answer, wondering if it contained some deeper Zen meaning. Over time, I came to realize the truth that Dorothy really had very little interest in abstractions. The interesting question for Dorothy was, not about the idea of anarchism, but how ideals were lived out and set in motion, took on flesh in people's lives, whether the case of St. Francis or St. Teresa or Sacco and Vanzetti. 
And by the same token, she was fascinated by other people and their stories, where they came from, where they traveled, what books they liked. What's your favorite novel by Dostoevsky, she might ask. It wasn't a test. She was genuinely curious. And it turned out she was not hard to get to know, especially if you weren't overly reverent. She thrived on conversations over a cup of coffee or around the kitchen table. She had a sly sense of humor and an almost girlish laugh. People were often surprised to hear that because in photos she almost always looked severe and intimidating. A few months after my arrival, Dorothy asked me to become managing editor of the paper. She was, as she liked to say, in retirement, and the day-to-day -day management of the paper and the household was in the hands of those she called the young people. At 20, I, I certainly qualified as young. Otherwise, I had no other obvious qualifications for anything. I actually wasn't even a Catholic, that's another story. <laughs> My selection evidently had more to do with the fact that no one else was particularly interested in the job. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'll say this. Dorothy had faith in people, and she was able to make them feel her faith in as well. She had an uncanny ability to discern and encourage people's hidden gifts and talents. I could scarcely imagine at the time that she was pointing me in the direction of my life's work and vocation. She didn't always endorse my editorial decisions, however, especially if the articles were too long or my tone was too sarcastic, as it often was, or the illustrations were too lugubrious. The only instruction actually that I can recall was the time she said to me, your job as editor is to make sure I don't look like a fool. <laughs> that was actually the least challenging aspect of the job. <coughs> Dorothy spent most of her life on the down and out among the sights and smells of poverty, eating plain and often ill-prepared food, contending with bed bugs and lice, constantly worrying about whether the morning's mail would bring enough to keep the lights on or cover the cost of beans. On so many occasions, she contended with drunkenness, madness, filth, and ugliness, as she used her own words. In light of this reality, I was surprised to discover her fastidious nature and her cultivated taste. She loved classical music, the opera, literature, flowers, and beautiful things. She covered the walls of her room in Mary House with postcards, icons and paintings, of course, but also pictures of nature, forests, the ocean, icebergs. One time when I was in jail, she sent me one of these postcards. An aerial photo of Cape Cod with the inscription, I hope this card refreshes you and does not tantalize you. She loved to quote Dostoevsky's words, the world will be saved by beauty. And for all the sadness and suffering that surrounded her, she never lacked an eye for the transcendent. There were always moments when it was possible to see beneath the surface. Just look at that tree, she would say, or it might be some act of kindness, or the opera on the radio, or some vines clinging to the fire escape in the middle of a slum. Moments like that that she noticed made her rejoice. There's a famous and telling story about the time that she, that someone donated a diamond ring to the Catholic worker. Everyone wondered what Dorothy would do with it. It certainly would have paid for a lot of beans. She gave it to an old woman who used to hang around the worker, a woman so disagreeable that she had earned the nickname the weasel. <laughs> When it was pointed out that that ring could cover the weasel's rent for most of a year, Dorothy said she can do what she wants with it. Use it for rent, take a trip to the Bahamas, or keep it to admire. She said, do you suppose God created diamonds only for the rich? When I heard that story, I recognized that distinctive audacity or over-the-topness that distinguishes holiness from just being especially nice whether it is St. Francis kissing a leper or the woman who wasted a large quantity of oil and anointing Christ's body. In the realm of her social activism, it has its analog in her reply to an exasperated IRS agent who asked her to estimate how much federal income tax she thought she owed. She answered, why don't you just figure out how much I owe, then you tell me, and then I just won't pay it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I had the privilege of spending a number of years editing Dorothy Day's personal papers, including her diaries, The Duty of Delight, and her letters, All the Way to Heaven. The phrase, The Duty of Delight, was a favorite of Dorothy's. She found it in a letter by the English critic John Ruskin, and it recurs throughout her diary so often as to become a kind of mantra, often recited after a, uh, following some drudgery or disappointment. It served as a reminder to find God in all things, the sorrows of daily life, as well as the moments of joy, both of which she experienced in abundance. As familiar as I thought I was with Dorothy's life and writings, working with these personal writings revealed dimensions of her humanity that came as a revelation. In her letters, the most astonishing discovery was the three dozen letters to Forster Batterham, the father of her daughter. <coughs> the father of her daughter, the man she liked to call her common-law husband. These letters date from the beginning of their romance in 1925 until the eve of her meeting with Peter Moore in 1932. Filled with passion and even erotic energy, they reflect the depth of her love for Forster. I think of you much and dream of you every night, she writes him, and if my dreams could affect you over long distance, I'm sure they would keep you awake. Or this, my desire for you is a painful rather than pleasurable emotion. It is a ravishing hunger which makes me want you more than anything in the world. It makes me feel as though I could barely exist until I saw you again. When she felt compelled to become a Catholic and forced to refuse to get married, she separated from him. In the long loneliness, she says it was literally a choice between God and man. But as the letters demonstrate, the break was not nearly as clear-cut as all that. For five years, she desperately hoped and prayed that Forster would change her mind and consent to marry her. So deep was her attachment to him that she felt she had to flee New York, moving with Tamar to California, then Mexico and Florida to resist the temptation to be with him. Do I have to be condemned to celibacy all my days just because of your pig-headedness, she wrote? <laughs> the letters have an almost unbearable pathos. The ache in my heart is intolerable at times, and sometimes for days I can feel your lips upon me, waking and sleeping. It's because I love you so much that I want you to marry me. I want to be in your arms every night as I used to be, and be with you always. But in the end she realized this was not to be. It was at this point, and no, that very same month, that she met Peter Moran. It's as if one door closed while another opened on the rest of her life. I find it extraordinary to think on the one hand how much her vocation depended on Forster's commitment to his own principles, which she respected. If it had been up to Dorothy, she would have married Forster, raised a house full of children, and continued to write plays and novels, and there would have been no Catholic worker, and we would not be gathered here today. At the same time, the story dramatizes the deep sacrifice that lay at the heart of Dorothy's vocation. It was the foundation for a lifetime of courage, perseverance, and dedication. It marked her deep sense of the heroic demands of faith, and it accounted for the high standards to which she held her friends and associates. Writing to a former Catholic worker editor, she advised him to resign as secretary of the Catholic Peace Organization. Um, did, I, did I skip that? that? He was planning to remarry without seeking an annulment. She wrote, when God asks great things of us, she wrote, great sacrifices, he intends to do great things with us. Though they will seem small, they will be most important. Who knows the power of the spirit? God's grace is more powerful than all the nuclear weapons that could be possibly accumulated. Dorothy Day was a witness or a participant in the great social and ecclesial movements of her day. She traveled to Cuba after the revolution. She fasted in Rome during Vatican II. She was shot at by the Ku Klux Klan in Georgia. She was arrested at 75 while picketing with United Farm Workers. But her diaries are a reminder that most of any life is occupied with ordinary activities and pursuits. Inspired by her favorite saint, Teresa de Lisieux, Dorothy was convinced that ordinary life was actually the true arena for holiness. Her spirituality was focused on the effort to practice forgiveness, charity, and patience with those closest at hand. 
Here the title of her diary, The Duty of Delight, really summarizes her approach to life. She believed that delight, like love, is a matter of discipline, a matter of the will. It's one thing to feel delight when things are delightful, and it's one thing to love people who are lovable, but the heart of the gospel is adding love, even when there is no love. Loving the person beside us, even if that person is disagreeable. I don't mean to suggest that, that Mother Teresa. <laughs> If you will to love someone, if you will to see Christ in them, you can do it. This is what Dorothy believed. Which didn't mean that this was any easier for Dorothy than it would be for the rest of us, but it was the exercise of charity in these small ways that equipped her for the extraordinary and heroic actions she performed on a wider stage. Like most holy people, she often fell short of her ideals. We know this because she herself calls attention to her faults, her impatience, her capacity for anger and self-righteousness. Someone once told Dorothy to hold her temper, and she responded, I hold more temper in one minute than you will in your entire life. <laughs> in her diary, she writes, I have a hard time, enough, a hard enough job to curb the anger in my own heart, which I, I sometimes even wake up with, go to sleep with a giant to strive with, an ugliness, a sorrow to me, a mighty struggle to love. As long as there is any resentment, bitterness, lack of love in my heart, I am powerless. God must help me. The diaries offer a frank and candid picture of the strain and stress of Catholic worker life, the overwhelming demands on Dorothy's time and attention, the rebukes of the, the demands of leadership, the rebukes she faced from those in her own community, I fail people daily, she wrote. God help me when they come to me for aid and sympathy. There are too many of them, whichever way I turn. It's not that I can do anything. I must always disappoint them and arouse their bitterness, especially when it is material things they want. But I deny them the Christ in me when I do not show them tenderness, love. God forgive me and make up to them for it. Often she re refers to her temptation simply to walk away from the Catholic worker the opposition to the work, the idea that I did not understand or interpret Peter Moore incorrectly. There's been many an occasion when I never wanted to see a Catholic worker again. But then she adds, some such thought as that of St. John of the Cross would come. Where there's no love, put love, and you will find love, and it makes it all right. When it comes down to it, even on the natural plane, it is much happier and more enlivening to love than to be loved. Than to be loved. She reacted strongly against the loose sexual mores of the 1960s, the counterculture, and she resisted their intrusion in the worker. At the same time, the memory of her own youthful struggles to make, uh, made her particularly sensitive to the searching and sufferings of youth. To a young woman in distress, she wrote, please forgive me for presuming to write you so personally, to intrude on you and your sufferings I'm doing but I felt I had to because I've gone through so much the same suffering as you and the confusion of my youth and my search for love. It's a very real agony of our own, wanting human love, fulfillment, and one so easily sees all the imperfections of this love we seek, the inability of others ever to satisfy this need of ours, the constant failure of those nearest and dearest to understand, to respond. In response, to the insecurity, the sorrows and drudgery of life among the insulted and injured. She tried always to remember the duty of delight. I was thinking how, as one gets older, we are tempted to sadness, knowing life as it is here on earth, the suffering of the cross, and how we must overcome it daily, growing in love and the joy which goes with loving. And through her diaries and letters, we see her gradually slowing down adjusting after a heart attack to the end of her restless pilgrimage. She had traveled the world. She had spent much of her life on a constant bus trip from one end of the country to the other. First she was confined to the city, then to Mary House, and finally to her room on the second floor where she spent much of her time gazing out the window on life outside on East Third Street, which the Catholic workers shared with the Hells Angels. In her youth, she writes, she had received a great revelation that for anyone attuned to the life of the mind, the future held the promise of unending fascination. And now she could observe, no matter how old I get, 
No matter how feeble, short of breath, and capable of walking more than a few blocks, what with murmurs, heart failure, emphysema perhaps, arthritis in feet and knees, all these symptoms of age and decrepitude, my heart can still leap for joy as I read and suddenly assent to some great truth enunciated by some great mind and heart. That intense interest in life continued as she took in the world around her and rummaged increasingly in the rag bag of memory. She had always been a compulsive writer, and writing was virtually the last thing to go. Toward the end, her newspaper columns reverted to short, breathless excerpts from her diary, just enough, she said, to let people know I'm still alive. She kept writing up until a few days before her death on November 29, 1980. It's surprising as we look back on our lives to measure the truly significant moments, which are relatively few. Often we don't recognize them at the time, except in retrospect and we look back over the paths that they illuminated. Dorothy Day died 35 years ago, and yet it seems like no time at all to me so much as her memory dominated my life. I remember her sitting in a room in Mary House, surrounded by books, icons, and all her memories. Yes, she was old. And yet her sense of adventure, her idealism, her instinct for the heroic always connects her in my mind with the spirit of youth. Though she grew old and hard of hearing and bent, she never acquired the cynicism or spirit of compromise that's a proverbial mark of maturity. She was already 75 when she was arrested with the farm workers when she risked arrest for refusing to pay federal taxes, when she started a house of hospitality for homeless women in New York City. Until the end, she was surrounded by young people. They've continued in large measure to be drawn to her story and inspired to take up her mission. I think of her now, after all these years and these times we're living through, when the gospel narrative is again dismissed as foolish and irrelevant in the face of terrorism, surveillance, and endless war. Once again, we confront a situation in which violence is proffered as the only realistic solution to our problems, where we are told the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. We can ridicule this model of the NRA, but it's virtually the credo of our national security state. We see the growing chasm between rich and poor, so many hungry, so many in prison, so many in search of work, the struggle of immigrants to be treated with dignity, the contempt that's directed to the poor and unemployed as mere takers, the virtual criminalization of anyone with long color skin. We see the earth ravaged in a short-term search for resources. We see our wasteful consumerism contributing to the perils of climate change, while nuclear weapons continue to hold humanity hostage. Dorothy and Peter had answers for all these problems, answers they found plainly in the Gospels. And once again, they raised the question, what would our society look like if it were organized around values of compassion, justice, solidarity, and concern for the common good, rather than selfishness, greed, and fear? Many years ago, I gave a talk on the centenary of Dorothy's birth and used the occasion to lay out the case for her canonization, highlighting what I saw as her primary gifts to the church, including her inspiration to the lay apostolate her initiative of combining the practice of charity with the struggle for justice, and her practice of gospel nonviolence. Dorothy, after all, did more than any other Catholic in modern times to recall the peace witness of Jesus, and she lived to see many of her principles vindicated in the teachings of the church. Now that same church has taken up the cause of her canonization, a long, laborious process that may result one day in her being officially named St. Dorothy. Who knows if any of us will live to see that day? I think the odds are, are looking better all the time. Whatever opinion Dorothy might have had of such a process, you can be sure she would have objected to any effort to airbrush her faults and failings, to put her on a pedestal and out of reach, to make her seem unapproachable, otherworldly, and mysterious. No doubt if she were with us today, she would urge us to attend to the words and witness of Pope Francis and the model of church he has envisioned, a church of and for the poor, a church that embraces those on the margins, that cries out for peace and the good of creation. 
that exemplifies the spirit of mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. I believe Dorothy's prayers and her vision are answered in Pope Francis, and I imagine the pleasure I would take in sitting together with her in her upper room and discussing his words and actions. I know that among Dorothy's admirers, there are many who remain skeptical about the process of canonization. As Ken Woodward noted many years ago in his book, Making Saints, Whereas in most cases the question is whether a person is worthy of canonization, in the case of Dorothy Day, the question is often whether the process of canonization is worthy of her. There are legitimate concerns about whether her measures will be co-opted or watered down or adapted to some agenda that was not her own. And yet, Dorothy had great respect for the ways of the church. And those who feel she's too good for its corrupt machinations might be the ones who are in fact putting her on a pedestal that she would have disdained. The fact is, if there's real thought about our canonization today, I think this is in large part a reflection of how far the church has traveled in catching up with her witness. Particularly in the context of this era of Pope Francis, I believe the cause for Dorothy's canonization contributes to the ongoing renewal of the church. The benefits that may come from our canonization belong to the church of the future, not just the church as it will be in generations to come, but the church as it might be. Still, in the purity of her vision and her courageous witness, she continues to walk ahead, beckoning the church to follow. It falls on us all to tell her story without softening any of her radical edges. But at the end of the day, the fundamental significance of Dorothy's cause for me rests not just in our own example of holiness, but in the way she held up the vocation of holiness as the common calling of all Christians. She did not believe holiness was just for a few or those dedicated to formal religious life. It was simply a matter of taking seriously the logic of our baptismal vows, to put off the old person and put on Christ, to grow constantly in our capacity for love. I believe here today there are representatives of Catholic worker communities and other affiliated movements. I don't expect the life of the Catholic worker has changed all that much in the past four decades, but when I ask myself what Dorothy Day would say today, perhaps the same words she wrote in her journal in the early years of the movement, and I'll conclude with these words. Oh yes, my dear comrades and fellow workers, I see only too clearly how bad things are with us, how bad you all are, and how bad a leader I am. I see it only too often and only too clearly. It's because I see it so clearly that I must lift up my head and keep in sight the aims we must always hold before us. I must see the large and generous picture of the new social order where justice dwelleth. I must always hold in mind the new earth where God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I must hold it in my mind for my own courage and for yours. Love and ever more love is the only solution to every problem that comes up. If we love each other enough, we will bear with each other's faults and burdens. If we love enough, we are going to light that fire in the hearts of others. And it is love that will burn out the sins and hatred that sadden us. It is love that will make us want to do great things for each other. No sacrifice and no suffering will then seem too much. Yes. I see only too clearly how bad people are. I wish I did not see it so. It is my own sins that give me such clarity. If I did not bear the scars of so many sins to dim my light, sight, and dull my capacity for love and joy, then I would see Christ more clearly in you all. I cannot worry much about your sins and miseries when I have so many of my own. I can only love you all, poor fellow travelers, fellow sufferers. I do not want to add one least straw to the burden you already carry. My prayer from day to day is that God will so enlarge my heart that I will see you all and live with you all in his love. Thank you very much.